a YouTube broadcast started. So thank you. Let me know when we're live and then we'll go ahead. All right, great. Uh, once again, uh, welcome to all of you. It's, it's great to see uh, all of you joining us uh, here today for these Quantum Many Body Days. Um, I want to point out, as I usually do for those of you that have been joining us uh, every Tuesday this month, that uh, this is just a series that's meant as a bridge to uh, the larger International Conference on Recent Progress in Many Body Theories. The 21st edition of that conference was planned for this year and for obvious reasons is postponed until next year. We hope we'll then bring the conference to, to Chapel Hill in September 2022. Um, I want to point out uh, that uh, on, on this website, you can see the uh, Fimber Memorial uh, Medal information. Uh, the nominations are, uh, are open and there's uh, deadline of uh, March 31st, 2022. And uh, if you want to um, nominate someone, um, you can contact David Nielsen. And if you want more information, you can find it on this link. There, we also have the Cumul Early Achievement Award. Uh, you can find more information here and, um, uh, and, and further information on, on the whole uh, Quantum Many Body series you can find on this uh, conference series wiki, which um, is hosted by Indiana University. And there's a lot of information about the whole series and the history of the series and the awards on this link. Going back to uh, our website, this is our, our uh, schedule, which I, I think most of you have uh, seen already. And for today, we have talks planned by uh, Subir Sashtev and Mac Max Metlitsky. Uh, I see uh, uh, both of them have joined. It's, it's great to, to have both of them here. Uh, and at this point, uh, I'll uh, introduce the speaker. So uh, Subir, if you're ready to, to share your slides, uh, please go ahead. Great, thank you. So I will say a few words. Um, uh, uh, and, and I want to say we're, we're very, very happy and honored that that Subir Sashtev is joining us uh, here today for this uh, last session of this uh, Quantum Anybody Days. Um, Subir got his PhD at Harvard in 1985. He was a postdoc at uh, the AT&T Bell Labs for a couple of years and, and quickly after that in 87 joined the faculty at Yale, where he remained until 2005. He then moved on to Harvard, where he is now as the uh, Herschel Smith Professor of Physics since 2015. In fact, I should say right now, he's the Maureen and John Hendricks Distinguished Visiting Professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. So, uh, so technically right now he is in Princeton, not really in Harvard. Uh, Subir has received numerous honors. I, I'll be brief uh, about those, the list is long. Uh, he is a Sloan Fellow, an APS Fellow, and a Guggenheim Fellow. And he's the recipient of the Lars Onsager Prize from the APS, uh, the Dirac Medal from the International Center for Theoretical Physics, together with Damson and Xiaogang Wen. And he's also a member of the National Academy of Science. Uh, as I said, uh, the list goes on, but uh, I don't want you to keep you waiting any longer. I'm sure you're all looking forward uh, to this talk. So without further ado, please uh, so we take it away. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Joaquin, for that very kind introduction and organizing these uh, great series of talks. I uh, hope uh, you'll also find this one interesting. Um, all right, so my talk is uh, mostly motivated by long-standing question on the cube rates and I want to present a, a new approach. And towards the end, um, I'll also show you some uh, fits to a lot of old data of our simple model. Uh, and hopefully you'll find uh, that interesting. Uh, but the approach is based upon, you know, uh, similar to an approach that was used earlier for the condo lattice, which is used to describe uh, heavy fermion compounds. Uh, and that's been extremely successful. And uh, so we're trying to extend the same success to the Hubbard model, which paradoxically turns out to be more difficult, even though the Hubbard model is simpler to write down. 
Okay, the, the, the central issue in my talk, uh, you know, running through everything uh, will be the Luttinger theorem. So this is a sort of a, uh, you know, classical theorem in the sense that it was discovered a long time ago in the 1960s. Uh, and what it states is that if you take the free electron model uh, of a metal, then you get a Fermi surface uh, and that Fermi surface uh, encloses a certain volume. Uh, and the statement is that that volume uh, does not change as you turn up the interaction. So there's a smooth connection from the non-interacting model to the interacting model uh, without any phase transition. Uh, and then the, uh, through, in, through in that process, the shape of the Fermi surface can change, but the volume enclosed can not change. Also, uh, as for free electrons, uh, filled bands don't count. And I'm thinking about uh, uh, para states with spin zero, with spin a half electrons. Uh, and so therefore a filled band has two, uh, two electrons per unit cell. So anything, uh, all this is measured mod two. Now, today we know that this theorem, even though it's called a theorem, uh, can be violated. And the reason, well, it's not strictly violated, <laughs> Uh, but there's a precondition in the theorem that there is no phase transition from the non-interacting system. So today we know that they can be more complicated states. They're known by various names, spin liquids, topological states, uh, although the word topological is now overused and mean many different things, so I'll avoid it. Uh, so I'll just call them spin liquids. Uh, and a spin liquid is, you know, exhibit one on how the Lutinger theorem uh, can be evaded, let me say, I should call it a violation. Uh, so here's a, the RVB picture of a spin liquid, or say on the triangle lattice, you have spins that form singlets, uh, and these things, uh, singlets can resonate. So the ground state then uh, is a equal superposition of all singlets. So this is a state that doesn't break any symmetry. Uh, and this state has exactly one electron per unit cell. Uh, and it can be obtained from a you know interacting electron model, uh, and uh, so that's clearly. But there's no Fermi surface. Uh, there's no Fermi surface here at all. So there's there is your violation of the Latin theorem. Okay, this might seem too you know well really not in the spirit of the Latin theorem because it's that fixed density. Density equals one. Uh, but what about other densities? Well, that's easy to remedy uh, by just taking two bands. So imagine I have a band that I call the F electrons that form a spin liquid and another band of conduction electrons, the C electron. Uh, and initially they're decoupled. Uh, and now I have a state which is no broken symmetry uh, where if the density of C electrons is P, the total number of electrons per unit cell is one plus P, one F and P C electrons. Uh, and this has a Fermi surface uh, and the Fermi surface size is P. It's not one plus P, the volume enclosed by the C Fermi surface is P. All right, so that's the decoupled limit, uh, but the non-trivial statement is that this decoupled state is stable to turning on the corner exchange. Uh, you know, normally you learn when you uh, have a condo exchange interaction that no matter how small it is, it's a relevant perturbation and flows to infinity. And that's why you get condo screening. Uh, but when uh, the spins are locked into singlets as they are in the spin liquid phase, that condo uh, instability is not present. And it's easy to show that in perturbation theory uh, of the condo coupling. Uh, and so there's a finite range of JK where this particular state is stable. Um, so we've called that the state, the FL star phase, the star saying that, well, it's a Fermi liquid in the sense that the Fermi surface of just ordinary electrons, uh, the star meaning that the volume, the size of the Fermi surface is not the naive one uh, that you would expect from the Luttinger theorem, but the smaller one. Okay. Uh, and this is stable over a range of densities and a range of JK. So it's, uh, you know, I think that can be fairly reliably established. So let's take a specific model. Uh, let's do write it out. Uh, and you have the conduction electrons from dispersion AP, the condo exchange JK, uh, and some Heisenberg exchange among the F electrons, which causes them to form a spin liquid. 
And so for a range of JK, starting from zero, uh, there is this FL star state, which violates the Lagrangian theorem. If you want a simple wave function of it, for it is here it is. Uh, you take a Slater determinant of the F electrons on the F band and you project to one F per site. So the first two lines will give you a spin liquid on the F sites. Uh, and then you just take a Slater determinant of C separately. Okay. But however, uh, the primary phase of the condo lattice in the vast majority of experiments is not this one. Uh, it's another one called the heavy Fermi liquid for which we have uh, you know, also a very beautiful and successful theory. Um, and the zeroth order statement of this theory is that if you want a wave function for the heavy Fermi liquid, uh, it's similar to this one here, but you take a linear combination of the C and F, you hybridize the bands, C and F mixed with each other, and you just get one Slater determinant. Uh, so that gives you the right, for, you know, the Luttinger volume of one plus P because it's one here and P there, and they just form a single Slater determinant. And then to account for the strong correlations, you project onto one F per site. Uh, and the content of a lot of the theoretical work uh, with these authors and others is to show that this projection operation is innocuous. It doesn't do much, uh, and you still preserve the large Fermi surface. Uh, a little more technically, let me try to say that uh, that you know say that a little more carefully. So you, if you have spins, you can write spins in terms of these spin-ons f, which I'm now calling spin-ons because they obey a constraint of exactly one spin-on on every side. So the moment you do this, you additional you introduce an infinite number of conservation laws, which is the number of spin-ons on each side, and that means there's a U1 gauge symmetry. We can rotate the F by this phase factor. So the total symmetry of the condo lattice problem uh, is the conservation of electron number, in which case it's the conservation of C electrons. They are the one that's moving around. And then there's the U1 gauge symmetry on the F sites. So the symmetry is U1 gauge times ordinary U1. Uh, and these gauge symmetries remain unbroken and deconfined. Uh, in the FL star phase because, well, the Fs remain independent of the Cs and the gauge symmetries are really independent of each other. And that's how you understand the stability of this phase. However, this phase, which is the one that's observed is paradoxically a little more difficult to understand once you take this point of view. So that state is obtained by Higgsing this symmetry. There's a Higgs field that condenses and that Higgs field is just the hybridization, the, this is the you know uh, exciton or between the F and the C electrons, uh, fermions, uh, and imagine this field condenses, and it's the condensation of this field that will mix the C and F and give you the mixed later determinant. So now you ask, how does this uh, Higgs field uh, break this complicated symmetry? Well, it actually doesn't break it completely. It breaks it down to a diagonal symmetry, uh, because if you rotate C and F by the same phase factor. Uh, B remains invariant. So this means that there is still an unbroken diagonal symmetry. Uh, and the Luttinger theorem, you know, is associated with global, with unbroken symmetry. Every time there's an unbroken U1 symmetry, you have a Luttinger theorem in any system, quantum system. Uh, and so therefore there is, there is a Luttinger theorem for U1 diag. Uh, but since both F and C are charged under U1 diag, uh, you get you count both of them, and that's why you get a large Fermi surface. So that's a more technical way of saying that this projection doesn't do much. Uh, the gates, you know, the, the U1 gauge is Higgsed in this diagonal part, and so the you, and there is there is a Higgs boson, and uh, there's a the emergent gauge field associated with U1 gauge, but they're all Higgsed out, so you don't have to worry about them. Okay, uh, and there's also now, now you have set up a phase transition here between the FL star and the heavy Fermi liquid, uh, which is a phase transition without any broken symmetry. So it's a novel non-Landau phase transition. Um, and there's a gauge theory for, its, uh, for this transition that was studied originally in this paper and, and there've been many other works since then. So, so that's basically, yes, Leo, go ahead. 
Yeah, I was wondering, you know, usually when we think about phase transitions, there are usually some pre-transitional uh, critical phenomena around the critical point. Sure. If it's a continuous transition. So is there any anything that one can observe uh, looking at the Fermi surface uh, that reflects this? Not uh, thermodynamics, but like looking at, well, I don't know, like in maybe the yeah. house of oscillations or something or... Uh, well, interesting you mentioned it. Here's some, here's some data. Okay, uh, sorry. I didn't. I haven't seen your talk, so, you know. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So uh, the answer is yes. I mean, uh, I'm not sure if we have a complete theory for the finite temperature crossovers, uh, but uh, there is a quasi-particle residue, um, you know, on, the, on a certain section of this Fermi surface where it vanishes at the critical point. And so the Fermi surface goes from large, large to small. Right near the critical point, the Fermi surface configurations are, you know, quite complicated and uh, depend on details. Uh, there's also some very nice work by uh, Avishkar Patel and Ehud Altman and company recently on finite temperature behavior uh, above this phase transition and comparing it to, in fact, Hall measurements in this cerium cobalt indium five. But uh, yeah, here's some other people. Uh, but uh, okay, <laughs> I I'll refer you to to them for more details because my talk is really about the Hubbard model. This is just for background. But can I just follow up just briefly? Sure, sure, please. So if I if I come from uh, uh, HFL, yeah, I should think of that the Fermi surface is remaining the same, but the weight of quasi particle residue is vanishing. Is that how I should think of it? Yeah, so what happens is that the Fermi surface starts splitting up. I mean, into there's still, it's not just one big Fermi surface. You uh -huh. start getting many bands, and, and one of the bands uh, has a quasi-particle residue vanishing, while the other one doesn't. I see. Thank I you. Know. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I don't... Yeah, you, I mean, you could imagine a more complicated uh, evolution where you go, where the Fermi surface just jumps from small to large. Uh, there have been various speculations of that type, but uh, that requires a more complicated theory than the one I'm presenting and the one that was looked at in this paper. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, there's been um, some of my, the recent papers that Yao Hui Zhang and I have written, we speculated on such transitions, but they end up involving rather strong coupling physics at the critical point, and it's quite hard to be very, very reliable, you know. Okay, great questions. Uh, please uh, go ahead and, uh, yeah, in fact, I think Leo raised his hand and then I immediately saw it on my screen. So that's probably the better way to, to, to ask your questions. Uh, so I was just briefly mentioning this data on cerium cobalt indium fire, where as a function of density, uh, they see various indications in the Hall effect, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the quantum oscillations uh, of uh, this jump in the Fermi surface volume. Uh, along, yeah, with interesting crossovers at finite temperature. Uh, and one of the nice things of these experiments and also actually of experiments, uh, STM experiments on many heavy fermion compounds, uh, is that you can literally see uh, a signature of this hybridization boson uh, in, in, in the data. All right, so now let's uh, go to the Hubbard model. Uh, uh, which, you know, the simpler model, just one band with the Hubbard repulsion U. Uh, of course, I'll consider the square lattice as motivated by the cuprate compound. So this is our basic model. Um, and if you uh, do a perturbation theory in U, uh, well, the Lattinger theorem should apply for any U in principle, as long as the perturbation theory is valid. Uh, and so, you so we consider a situation, we start from half filling, and then you remove p electrons. So the number of, I'll talk in terms of holes in this part of the talk. So there's one plus p holes uh, for all u and all p provided no symmetry is broken. Okay, so this is my one bank of electrons. Um, so there's something I'm, which was called by these famous people, the vanilla theory of this Hubbard model. And the vanilla theory is very similar in a sense to the heavy Fermi liquid theory, uh, which many of these people had worked on earlier. 
Uh, and basically, you just take a stated determinant of the single band of C, and you project out W occupied sites. So that's a vanilla wave function. Uh, and an obvious property of this wave function, given the history of the uh, uh, of the heavy fermions, is that the Fermi volume should be one plus p. Uh, this projection operation, sometimes called the Brinkman Rice enhancement of the quasi particle mass, and in the simplest theory, this quasi particle mass diverges as p goes to zero. Uh, but in more careful theory, that's not the case. But there is definitely an enhancement. Uh, in uh, of the quasi particle mass due to the projection. All right, so that's a nice picture. Uh, and we can now ask how does it compare with experiments? So here's the phase diagram of the cuprates, uh, temperature and doping. Uh, and we're just going to look at the metallic phases in this regime up here, let's say above 100 and 150 Kelvin to be safe. Uh, where there is no broken symmetry in any material, but there clearly is in the experiments uh, interesting physics going on in the structure of this metallic state. Uh, and the point of view in my talk is that whatever is going on in here is intrinsically a quantum zero temperature phenomenon. So I would like to think of it in terms of quantum language rather than some thermal fluctuations of some classically, uh, some simpler state. I want to think of some intrinsically quantum states, which in principle could be stable down to zero temperature in the right model. They just don't happen to be stable uh, in, in real life in this material. Okay, so that's definitely the point of view. And I think there's a lot of evidence supporting that general point of view. All right, so let's talk about these metallic phases as if there were zero temperature phases. So at large doping, there's a Fermi liquid. Uh, and uh, indeed, you know, it has a Fermi surface of volume one plus P holes. All right, so the, this you know, is basically all the cuprates. So, and this works very beautifully. Uh, you can measure the dispersion carefully. So the vanilla theory certainly is okay uh, at large doping. All right, so now I'm going to talk about lower doping uh, where the vanilla theory does not work uh, and give you our latest thoughts on how we think about this regime. Okay, so there are, as you go to lower doping, some region here near optimal doping, people often call the strange metal, but the remaining part of my talk will be about the pseudo gap metal, a metal over here. So what are some of the, you know, again, there's a huge amount of measurements. I'll just focus on a few uh, recent observations. So the first thing you can do is look for the Fermi surface here. Um, and uh, what you find instead of getting that closed Fermi surface of volume one plus P, um, you see these arcs uh, near in what are called the nodal regions. Uh, and, uh, and no Fermi surface here, meaning there's a gap. And so this is why it's called a pseudo gap because there's a, this region, there's an energy gap to fermionic excitations uh, in what's called the anti-nodal region uh, near wave vector pi zero. Okay, uh, now no one's theory has arcs, or at least I believe no reasonable theory has arcs. Uh, and so this, so somehow this must be closed in some way then, uh, but maybe because of experiment resolution and finite temperature, you're not seeing uh, a closed Fermi surface. Uh, okay, so, so here's some more data in, oh, sorry, uh, in this region. So what I'm gonna do now, is take a cut uh, over here and a cut over there. So we need, let's take the cut over here. But here there's a gap to fermionic excitations. Uh, and we're going to look at energy as a function of momentum. We look at the dispersion of excitations here, which clearly cannot cross zero because uh, uh, there is nothing there at zero energy in this picture. So that's what we're doing here. We're taking moving at Ky at kx equals pi. And if you do it on the overdope side or at very high temperatures, uh, you see this dispersion over here, which crosses the Fermi level at these two points, kf1 and kf2. Uh, and those are the points uh, corresponding, sorry, to here. Suppose you did it here, you went to a cut here, you will see a Fermi point here and a Fermi point there. So those two points 
um, are here. On the other hand, if you go the underdope side, you see the blue line. Don't worry about the green, that's something else. Uh, so the green, the blue line uh, is what this red line transforms into in the pseudo gap regime. So now there's a clean gap. Uh, there's no excitation crossing zero energy. These are below the Fermi level. Uh, and uh, also an interesting thing that uh, especially Patrick Lee has uh, emphasized, or actually was emphasized in this paper already by Hay et al. from the Stanford group, uh, that the Fermi wave vector here, KF, differs from the Fermi wave vector here, the maximum. Now, you know, one simple theory would be that this gap is due to some kind of incipient superconducting state that is due to pairing. And the simplest superconducting state uh, would imply that this would give you a dispersion like this, but the maximum of the dispersion here would be exactly at the Fermi level. And there's a clear separation. Uh, so that's, so it can't be just the simplest type of pairing fluctuations. Um, so Patrick Lee in particular has suggested that there's a pair density wave that can make this shift. All right. Uh, I'll present an alternative explanation uh, later. Okay. Uh, and this cut of the same thing uh, is on near the nodal kx equals two. So that means you're, you're somewhere here uh, and you're making the cut over here. Uh, and in this region, as you can see also from this picture, there isn't much difference between, you know, in this region here, there isn't much difference in the Fermi surface between overdoping and underdoping. It remains about the same. Uh, and that's kind of what you see here too. This is the so Fermi points are here, uh, but even below the Fermi level of dispersion, they're pretty much unchanged between underdoping and overdoping. All right, so, so that's one set of data, which I'll return to. Uh, here is a more recent uh, observation of angle dependent magneto resistance. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, uh, but this short summary is that if you look at the angle dependent magneto resistance on the overdope side, it fits the large Fermi surface very well. Whereas if you look on the underdope side, uh, it fits uh, these, this kind of Fermi surface best, where you have an arc with a backside. Now, of course, here, since you're not ejecting electrons from uh, the system as you do in photoemission, the, the quasi-particle residue makes no difference. And so that's why the intensity on the black and the front are, it's sufficient to consider them the same quasi-particle, just that the residue is different in the back. But that, that will not show up in this particular experiment. Um, okay, so I presented some of the data of the, of the pseudo gap metal um, and inspired by the condo lattice, uh, I'm going to look at the hypothesis that this metal uh, before any kind of Fermi surface breaking sets in uh, is the analog of the FL star in the condo lattice that uh, it has electron like quasi particles on a small Fermi surface of size P. All right, so that's uh, okay. Now, there's no shortage of very closely related ideas in the literature by many people. I've just mentioned a few here uh, and, uh, and no shortages of papers by me either. I've mentioned a few here, all exploring very related ideas. Uh, what I'll just do is summarize a, a simple picture that was in this paper. Uh, and also, also illustrate why you know these are, in some general sense these ideas are correct in all these papers, but they don't lead to any. Uh, they still lead to a lot of difficulty because uh, of actually describing the state in some reasonable way that you can fit the data. Okay, so but which I will try to present. All right, so let me give you a very simple picture of how you get an FL star uh, in the uh, in and the low doping metal. So again, we start from a spin liquid, just as we started in the condo lattice. And now we don't have a second band, so we remove some electrons on the same band. And so you, in a spin liquid, if you remove some electrons, you'll be left with uh, charge E spin zero holes, which we call holons. Uh, and these can move. Um, and uh, so the spins resonate and the holons can move. The, the holons are moving. 
Uh, and if these holons are fermions, as they are in some models, you'll get a small Fermi surface of size P. But before you declare victory, uh, you should note that uh, that's a Fermi surface, not of electrons, but of holons. The Fermi quasi-particles will not have spin. Uh, and that doesn't agree with many uh, experimental facts. So this, is, this model of a holon metal uh, with a small Fermi surface uh, is, not, is not fine. So how do you fix it? Well, you, you also have to bring in spin. So there are also other excitations of the spin liquid, uh, which are the spin a half objects, which carry spin, but no charge, which can move around. Now these cost some energy, uh, but now we imagine that what happens is that as these spin-ons and holons are moving around, uh, they attract each other. So for example, these two are attracting each other and they form a bound state. So this bound state is just a superposition of, uh, of a holon and a spin-on hopping back and forth as issue. There's a very simple strong coupling picture shown here. So now you have these spin singlets with the blue ellipses and uh, these objects, the whole on spin on bound states, which is the original electron really, spin a half and charge plus E. Uh, and now we imagine that these bound states can move around. And now you have an FL star, uh, but you notice that the whole procedure was rather cumbersome. You started out with electrons, you fractionalize the electrons into spin ons and whole ons, and then you put it back together again, but not all of them, just the ones that were associated with the holons. Uh, and that gave you a smaller density and also gave you a spin liquid in the back, just like in the condo lattice where there was a spin liquids hanging around to cause the violation. Uh, so, you know, I think this toy model picture is pretty much correct, but uh, other than being very strong coupling, it's not clear at all that the bound states are such, in fact, almost certainly not uh, such small bound states. Anyway, so that's the picture. Uh, and what we want to be able to do is actually come up with a theory which you can calculate with and also understand the nature of the transition between FL star and FL. That picture doesn't tell you at all how you get back the Fermi liquid. So the main lesson I want to take away from this discussion and from the condo lattice um, is that this this ansatz, which is literally in thousands of papers, including my own, uh, is not very good. You don't want to do this. Uh, you know, uh, you take your electron, you split it into a uh, spin-on and a hole-on, uh, and then you find actually the spin-on and hole-on attract each other uh, and form a bound state. And in fact, this bound state formation uh, is very strong. It occurs on an energy scale T, which is much larger than the spin uh, resonating valence bond formation, which is on an energy scale J. So, uh, so this invariably will happen in any TJ model where T is bigger than J. That's what the experiments and these simple arguments tell you. Uh, so this seems like, and, and also remember that we never did this in the, this kind of fractionalization, uh, in the condo lattice. In the condo lattice, we fractionalize the spin-ons on the F site, but we never fractionalize the mobile electron. It was it just remained the electron. It hybridized with the spin-ons after a while, but it didn't fractionalize. So we want to preserve that basic feature for the condo lattice, for the Hubbard model. Okay. So I'm going to tell you our recent results. Uh, the main idea originally is uh, due to Yahui Jiang, a postdoc at Harvard, who is now going to be faculty at Johns Hopkins, uh, and uh, two of my students, Maria and Alexander, uh, have also contributed valuable things. Okay, so the way I'm going to motivate it here uh, is by something familiar, the paramagnon theory. You know, the paramagnon theory goes back, uh, I would say, I don't know, to the 1960s by Burke and Schieffer and Doniak and Engelsberg. Uh, and it's a theory of fluctuations of magnetism in a metal. You just start with a metal and you treat it in a weak coupling manner. You say, here's the Hubbard model. Uh, and then you take this Hubbard interaction and you write it as the square of the spin on each side. And then you use the Hubbard-Sotronovich transformation uh, to decouple it. 
I have a feeling Hubbard name is attached to this because he precisely applied it to this model in this uh, in something like in this manner. So you end up with a field phi, which I'll call a paramagnon. Uh, and that field phi is coupled to the conduction electron. Uh, and some, you know, this paramagnon acquires some dynamics as you do some RG, uh, and then it can condense to give you a magnetic state. And if it's not condensed, uh, then you get uh, a paramag, you know, a metal with lots of magnetic fluctuations. That's why it's called a para. Uh, and uh, that can be compared to all kinds of experiments. Uh, and, and, you know, this kind of picture is the foundation of uh, a lot of spin fluctuation theories of superconductivity and so on. So we want to take this picture, but I'm now going to take this paramagnon theory and write it in Hamiltonian form. And this I claim is a reasonable Hamiltonian form for it. So here's our conduction electrons. Uh, and I claim all I'm doing is just rewriting the Hubbard model. Uh, and then I couple each site to a rotor, a quantum rotor. So what is a rotor? Well, a rotor is a particle moving on a sphere. Uh, so it has some angular momentum. So this is the angular momentum of that particle. And this is the moment of inertia of that particle, G. Uh, and unit circle phi equals one. So what have I done here? Well, all I've done is I've started from this theory um, and I have integrated out the high energy electrons far from the Fermi surface. So that gives me some kinetic energy for phi and also potential for phi. So I take the potential for phi and assume it has a deep minimum at phi equals one after some rescaling. And then the kinetic energy for phi just becomes the angular momentum square. All right, so here's a rotor model, which you know, you can, is basically rewriting of the paramagnon theory. I haven't introduced any new degrees of freedom because I integrated out high, high energy electrons to get these rotors. Uh, okay, so what is the spectrum of the rotor? Uh, this, if I just had one rotor like this, it's spectrum you can figure out. <laughs> this is undergraduate quantum mechanics. It's an L into L plus one over two G, uh, where L is any positive non-negative integer. Uh, and so there's a singlet ground state, L equals zero, and a triplet excited states, and so on. Uh, I'll just pick the, the lowest two. Okay, so in fact, I'm removing degrees of freedom now. <laughs> and what I'm going to do now is re project to these lower, lowest two states uh, and think of this singlet and triplet uh, as the singlet and triplet state of a pair of ancilla spins. So I introduce an ancilla spin a pair on, on, on each rotor and their equivalent. Uh, and in this subspace, the angular momentum and this phi, the paramagnon field are S1 plus S2 and S1 minus S2. Okay, so now I just rewrite this Hamiltonian uh, using the S's. Okay, so then what do you get? Uh, well, then you get our model, uh, the ancilla model. So on, on each side, I have a singlet, I have a pair of spins, which can form a singlet or a triplet. The splitting between them is J perp. So therefore this J perp uh, is exactly equal to G. Uh, and that's all it has. It doesn't have the higher angular momentum states. Uh, then I have this coupling J condo between the ancilla layer and the first, uh, between the electrons and the first ancilla layer and no coupling between the electrons and the second ancilla layer. Uh, you can put one if you want, but for simplicity, I only put that, but they don't have to be equal. And the reason they don't have to be equal uh, is because of this minus sign. Uh, the phi field couples differently, uh, S1 and S2 couple differently to, to the physical electron. Okay. Uh, so I have this coupling I call J condo. Um, and uh, J perp is this uh, splitting. And so here's another model uh, that I can now write down. Now it's the conduction electrons as before, uh, with coupled to this bilayer uh, of ancillas. This is a square lattice, not a, not a one dimensional system. Now in the limit of J perp, large J perp, uh, you can now show, you can undo everything just to check that your check as a sanity check, you can undo the whole transformation in one over J perp and you get back the Hubbard model. 
So the U and J of the, well, you get the Hubbard Heisenberg model. Uh, and U and J are related to JK and J perp in some manner. Okay. All right. So that's a lot of uh, stuff to just rewriting the Hubbard model in some fun ways. Uh, and the most important point here really uh, is that you have to in inter introduce a pair uh, of sp spins on each side. You can't introduce just one. You have to introduce a pair. Uh, that's allowed by this, by this paramagnon approach. Okay. So now, of course, uh, now things are starting to look up because this looks like the condo lattice. So we're just going to do the very simple things that we did in the condo lattice uh, to this model. It's like two sets of spin, you know, two spin layers and one conduction band. Yes, Leo. Oh yeah, I was just wondering whether, so if, if I have a, maybe you said this, if I have a coupling to S2, condo coupling to S2, but it's, as long as I keep it different, it's, yeah. it's the same model, it's the same behavior, you think? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of freedom in choosing these couplings, at least if you want to really map it on, you know, you, you can choose something in convenience. But what you would like to think would be reasonable is if this is anti-ferromagnetic, which we want it to be, uh, then this coupling here to the second layer would be ferromagnetic because these two spins want to form a singlet. Right. Uh, and so if this is, this, this, if this is anti-parallel to that, it's going to be parallel to this. So it's, and that's what also comes out from this minus sign here. Mm -hmm. So there's a ferromagnetic condo coupling. And so that we know is not, usually very important so that's why I, guess I, see. Important. I see that's why you drop it okay yeah yeah okay thank you sure okay so now we'll just do our uh, simple variational wave functions on this system okay so first of all uh, at large j perp uh, i'm back to where i started uh, i get the vanilla theory well, almost, it's even worse than the middle left here because I don't get any projection. The spins form singlets, uh, and uh, this is just a vegetable. It's a trivial insulator that you can forget about, uh, apart from some virtual effects on the conduction band. The conduction band uh, has all the electrons of density one plus P, so they form a large Fermi surface. So there's your, uh, your Fermi liquid ground state, uh, basically the spirit of the vanilla theory. Okay, but now this is for small JK. So now notice JK is running this way for small JK. But let's make imagine that as you turn up JK, the condo uh, screening between the conduction layer from the first layer will take over. So what happens then? Uh, well, then these two, uh, the first layer the conduction electrons uh, and the first layer will form a heavy Fermi liquid, just like the condo lattice. The first two layers are just like the original condo lattice. So they'll form a large Fermi surface state. All right, what's the dense size of the Fermi surface, the large Fermi surface? Well, the density of a holes is uh, one, P here, one plus P here and one here. So the total density is two plus P, but you just remember you measure everything mod two. So there you have a, what was the large Fermi surface in the condo lattice now becomes the small Fermi surface here. And then you can't forget the second layer is still there. And the second layer has to form a spin liquid. So there will be a spin liquid uh, forming here, just like you know, it could be any spin liquid. Uh, and you can take some simple choices um, uh, for that, which is what we did in our papers. Um, and there it is. So now you notice there's a kind of an inversion from what happened for the condo lattice. Um, here, this state violates the Lattinger theorem uh, for the original Hubbard model. It has a wrong size Fermi surface. Uh, and that must mean there must be some spin liquid around. And yes, sure enough, it's there in the second layer. Uh, Okay, so it is FL star, even though it's more, in some sense, it's like the uh, uh, heavy Fermi liquid phase uh, of the condo. Okay. So we are in some ways, you know, really in familiar and successful grounds, because we know that the theory of the heavy Fermi liquid, non-trivial as it is, applies very well to most condo lattice compounds. And so let's hope it applies here in the anodope side. 
All right, so now I have a wave function. Uh, I mix the first two layers. So I form a state of determinant of C and layer one. I'm calling the fermions on layer one, psi one. And then I make state of determinant of psi two. And now I project onto the wrong singlets of this wave function so that these go out. So this is a wave function, which only involves on the left-hand side, the coordinates of the physical electrons. The coordinates of psi one and psi two are it's projected out into the singlet subspace. Okay. Uh, so there's an explicit wave function for the wrong size Fermi surface uh, in the single band Hubbard model, something we haven't had before. Uh, okay, well, that's the spin liquid. If you want a little more detail, you know, now you can set this up as a gauge theory, these ideas, and uh, it looks rather daunting. Uh, it turns out to begin with to be an SU2 cross SU2 cross SU2 gauge theory. Uh, what are all those SU2? But fortunately, most of them are broken or can be neglected to leading order uh, in both phases. Uh, so what are these different SU2s? Well, there's one SU2, which is the usual SU2 that would, you would find in, uh, in this review article because of when you have spins. Anytime you have spins, you have an SU2 gauge symmetry because you have a projection of one electron, one fermion per site. But here you have to do something different. You also have to project onto spin singlets uh, between the ancillas. And that requires uh, a rotation, uh, somewhat different gauge rotation than this one. If you write your fermions in this matrix form, it's a left rotation rather than a right rotation. Uh, and this is the type of rotation that uh, first appeared in this paper uh, that I wrote with Max and others. Uh, and really you have to combine uh, the more traditional SU2 gauge theory with this other SU2 gauge theory, and then you get what you get. Okay. So I won't go into the details. There's you know a lot of, uh, it leads to, especially at the transition, a very strongly coupled theory, which we only have some speculations of what its properties may be. Uh, but at this critical point, the critical parts are the SU2 cross U1 gauge theory. Curiously, this is the same gauge group as the theory of the weak interaction, but this is just what comes out. <laughs> uh, and uh, right, and these are the, the two states. Okay, so that's uh, pretty much what I want, what I, might, I have about a few more minutes. And now what I want to do is to take this very, this theory and take a very simple mean field theory of the FL star phase and compare it to the data. So here's what we do. Um, you, in this SU2 cross SU2 gauge theory of the first two layers is fully broken by a Higgs condensate. This is exactly what happened in the heavy Fermi liquid phase uh, of, the, uh, of the condo lattice where the U1 gauge was broken to a diagonal U1 and that's actually what happens here too. Um, maybe I should rewrite that more carefully. So you end up having uh, the conduction band you have the ancilla band with some T1s, and these are our free parameters at the moment. Uh, and the phi is the Higgs condensate, which breaks the gate symmetry, and hybridize is the, the conduction band with the first ancilla layer. So this phi, this will determine the size of the pseudo gap. So it's not, you don't have too much freedom in choosing its value. All right, so now I'll just show you, you can just, you know, you have a small number of, you have a few variational uh, free parameters, but it's very easy to find, uh, to, well, not, no, this is something that uh, Alex did maybe, I, I think it's reasonably easy to find a set of parameters, which basically fits data over a wide range of momentum and frequency scale. So for example, so here's what's uh, happening in this uh, Fermi level plot in the underdope. Uh, the red line is the Fermi surface of the C the dashed line is the Fermi surface of the psi. And then when you mix them up, you get a Fermi surface, which is this, this blue line here. Uh, and this is the same date. Uh, this is a theory, but, but you now look at the photo emission data by looking at the spectral weight. And there's definitely spectral weight at the back, which has never been seen. Uh, but anyway, at least the front side uh, doesn't look too bad when compared to this. So when you, so this again, you know, there's not, that pretty much fixes a lot of the free parameters because you have to fit the position of this arc. Uh, and then now you can compare to what happens on the antinode. 
So here I'm plotting uh, what happens to the dispersion uh, as you go here, just like I showed you for the data earlier. So you find there, uh, let's see if I got this right. So here's the original red band is the C electrons, this dashed line are the size, uh, and when they mix, they give you the blue line uh, on the anti-node. And I remind you, this is what you see here with the same color scheme. And the, and the maximum is shifted from the Fermi, Fermi point. Okay. And then this is on the nodal side, when you take a cut across the node, and there you see that the overdoped, the red line and the underdope don't differ very much. This back, this is the back side of the pocket here. This is the front side. Uh, there's no intensity here. Um, and this dispersion anyway, before the below the Fermi level, again, fits the what's seen in the experiments really well. There's hardly any change between the overdoped and underdoped. Now I'd mentioned uh, this pair density wave model for this shift in the Fermi wave vector. Uh, and this is the computation of the pair density wave uh, in Patrick's paper. And that, okay, it does a reasonable job at the anti nodes, but if you take the same model and apply it to the nodes, it doesn't look anything like the data. It's got all this strange stuff happening here, which you don't see in the experiments. Um, this is a model that to begin with doesn't make sense because nobody sees spin density wave fluctuations at these temperatures. Uh, but here again, you find that it doesn't do, you know, it can do a reasonable job on the nodes, uh, yeah, on the pockets, but it, it doesn't do a good job on the anti nodes. There's another band here, which is very close to the Fermi level, which you don't see. Okay, uh, so I conclude there. So um, the main actor in my discussion here uh, has been this FL star state, which which, you know, very loosely speaking, you can think of as a small density of fermions forming a small Fermi surface plus a spin liquid uh, and weakly interacting with, uh, with the Fermi surface. Uh, and the condo lattice, you know, is quite simple to imagine such a phase and uh, there's perhaps some experimental evidence for such a phase. Uh, but such a phase, if, if you're correct, has you know, been sitting before us for the longest time, <laughs> the cube rates. Uh, it's clearly there, something bizarre going on. And this, um, this ancilla model just easily fits uh, the photo emission observations. Um, and also presumably the angle dependent magneto resistance, well, although we haven't done a careful calculation of that. Um, and the basic idea, you know, the, the slogan, if you want to take one from this talk, is that uh, the popular procedure of fractionalizing moving electrons should be history. And what you should really fractionalize is the paramagnum, not the electron, but the paramagnum. And then you immediately get what you need. Uh, then we've done a lot of work, which I didn't really talk about, of, the, of this quantum phase transition. Uh, it gives you some uh, strongly coupled gauge theories and. Uh, Perhaps this has something to do with the strange metal. Uh, that's something we are thinking about. Okay, thank you very much. All right, well, um, so thank you, Subir, for this uh, very nice, very interesting talk. Um, so um, we have time for questions before uh, Max's talk. So I see one hand. Uh, uh, Henri, please. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, well, I. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Subir. This Hello, is Henri. It's very interesting. Uh, uh, I wonder whether uh, uh, whether you could explain with this, this, this frame uh, a very old story that we have, which which is the the magnetism of uh, uh, induced by impurities. I'm sure yes. you know the situation with the zinc. Yes, we yes. Have, we have shown absolutely. In uh, Ari, I'm, we are working on that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we I hope to have a paper soon. But I let me let you know. I, we are optimistic. We can understand some of the old zinc impurity data. But that's exactly I, what we're working on. <laughs> okay. that, that's very good. I, I just want to recall not the zinc work, but the lithium work that we did with the Julien Bobrov, which is quite analogous to the zinc. The, 
only yeah. difference is that with the lithium, we could uh, measure carefully the spin susceptibility on uh, using the lithium NMR. Yes. And in fact, what we found in that case is that uh, it, it has a Curie, a Curie vice dependence with right. vice temperature, which evolves when you go towards overdoping. Uh, uh, so the, the vice temperature becomes very large when you reach the optimum. Uh, and as you expect, if you go to the pure Fermi liquid case, the, the non-magnetic impurity will not induce any magnetism at the end. Right. So the trend looked like condo, and I think in our papers we, we, call, we call that condo-like behavior of the, uh, of the impurity-induced magnetism. It's not, the, it's not the impurity on the lithium, it's the, it's the susceptibility which is induced in the, in the bulk. So in, in the, uh, in no, the pseudo gap state, state. In, in, in the pseudo gap state, right? Yeah. Not yeah. in the formula. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, that, I, think, I think that kind of picture is very naturally will appear in this model. Uh, and we are working on, you know, we're trying to make it a bit more quantitative, but it, it's- That, that it, would be very nice because this is a very yeah. old, Experiment which is has nothing spectroscopic in it. Right. <laughs> no, no. I mean, uh, I was well aware of your, of course, as you know, I've been following your work for many years, and uh, this whole idea of ancillas and spins was very was motivated by some of these observations. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I have a, another remark, which is that all this doesn't deal with superconductivity. You are just, uh, you yeah. are just speaking of the normal state. And yes. I, think, I think this can happen as well in other situations, in correlated systems, which are maybe even not superconductor. I am thinking of the, about the Kagome system that I have some work uh, going on. on, the, on, on, on but the this is, you can dope the Kagome system or what? Is this a dope Kagome system? This is the case which is a dope, naturally doped Kagome system. But oh. you know, there are Kagome metals nowadays. Yeah. So yeah. whether oh, yeah. Those tend to be ferromagnetic, if I remember. <laughs> yes, some of them. But I, I, uh, the, the one I am speaking about is in between and is not non superconducting. Maybe you will see the paper. I'll send you the paper. All right. Thank you, Henri. Good to talk uh, to you. you. There is one on, on the archive. There is one. Yes. On uh, okay. Great. And okay, so we, uh, um, we should move on. So uh, Jan and then James, please. Um, hi, Subir. Thanks for the inspiring talk. Uh, one you. part of your argument that I got lost a little bit is when you uh, introduce these paramagnon rotors, which are then fractional, uh, which are then mm -hmm. fractionalized into ancillary qubits. Could you uh, explain again how do you come onto these rotors? I mean, there must be some effective degrees of freedom, but I didn't fully follow how you got there. Yes, starting, okay. starting from the initial Hubbard model. Yes. All right. Uh, so. Yeah, I wish, let me see. Uh, I can't write here. It would be great to, uh, if I had my iPad connected, but let me just try without writing. Uh, so you start, okay, up to this point, everything is exact, okay? Yeah. Uh, then you, so the only term that depends on phi, apart from the this coupling is phi squared. So the only term is phi squared. All right, so now you do some RG we integrate our electrons far from the Fermi surface, then that will induce uh, d phi d tau uh, whole square. Okay, there won't be any damping because you're only looking at high energy RG, you're integrating out fermions very far from the Fermi surface. So that will induce a d phi d tau square, also induce a phi to the fourth term and a, a change of coefficient of the phi squared term and so on. So you'll get both a uh, time derivative squared term and some general potential V of phi. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now I assume that the shape of the potential V of phi is such that it has a deep minimum near phi equals one. So, mm -hmm. so I just uh, put, I just sit my, myself at the minimum and at phi equals one. Okay. And so these steps um, sort of done. Um, yeah. Can they be performed explicitly or is it sort of a hypothesis that this will happen? Well, I mean, uh, in principle, they can be performed explicitly. Yes. Uh, you know, you get a lot of messy numbers. You have to do some RG. 
uh, and you change the bandwidth of your electrons and you will get some, it will get, surely you will get d phi d tau squared terms uh, and you'll get some v of phi. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm actually perfectly happy to have a general v of phi. The only thing I really need that it has a uh, some kind of minimum yeah. at a non-zero value of phi. So as long as v of phi has a minimum at non-zero value of phi, it's pretty much guaranteed that the, the states, the phi states that you'll now get, if I just diagonalize the Hamiltonian for the phi, would have a single ground state and a triplet excited state. Yeah. Okay, That's no, all I need. Yeah. Okay, I just need some local quantum mechanics for phi that give me a singlet ground state and a triplet excited state. That's all I need. The rotor is one extreme limit of it. That's all. Thank you. Sure. James? Uh, hi, Sub. Hi, Subir. How are you doing? Hi, James. Hi, Sock. I liked it. Uh, yeah, three, three questions. Sure. Uh, there's a, a literature of uh, numerical solutions for the Hubbard model, which are said to be pretty good. And the question is, are they catching this physics? And we just didn't know about it. Um, that's one question I might ask. And maybe a little bit related, is there any connection at all between the pseudo gap phase and the superconductivity or, or they are just two different peculiar phenomena of the cuprates? And then maybe one last little side point. I, I would have thought in the Cerium 115 that the small Fermi surface was associated with antiferromagnetism rather than some kind of spin liquid. But maybe I just somehow have missed something as the time is very much. Great talk. Thank you, Jim. Uh, okay, there's <laughs> many questions there. Uh, quick answer on the, uh, the last question, the data by James Analytis. Uh, there is, there is antiferromagnetism in that compound, but what James has argued, oh, sorry, this is really slow. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, oops, I went too far. <laughs> I don't know why my computer is acting up. Anyway, so once I get to that point, uh, let me say that there is an antiferromagnetic phase, but what James showed is that there's a window of P where there is no antiferromagnetism uh, and still uh, a Fermi surface. Okay, my, you can still hear me, right? My, my wheel is spinning, so I don't know what's going on. Okay, uh, yes, I can see you all and I think you can hear me. Uh, yeah, okay. Right, so if you look at this phase diagram, uh, here's the antiferromagnet, uh, and there's a window where the small Fermi surface survives after the antiferromagnet disappears. So that was question number one. Uh, another question was about superconductivity. Uh, well, I believe that, you know, D wave superconductivity and the pseudo gap are both features of the same Hubbard model. Uh, and where, but they're different features. Uh, one has to do, you know, I think with this uh, spin liquid type physics, but another consequence of the same spin liquid physics is presumably uh, superconductivity. But the main content point is that I did, we didn't need any pairing fluctuations at all uh, to fully match the photo emission data. You know, so that's, in that sense, superconductivity is not important. Uh, how they're all connected and what happens near TC? Well, that's a question for future research. Uh, and then I forgot the third question. Uh, yeah, yeah, whether the numerical solutions oh, yes, of uh, course. have to be good uh, are catching this physics or not or what? Um, you, so the you know the there are a lot of numerical work, especially by you know Antoine George and company and. Uh, uh, I will also mention uh, uh, Andre Marie Tremblay has done a lot of very nice work uh, using various self consistent Green's function methods. Uh, and they give a, a spectrum along the pseudo gap, which is very similar to the experimental observations. So we could have tried to fit the numerical data, but we, I mean, but sometimes the numerical data is an imaginary time, so it doesn't have quite the detailed observations that you have in the experiments. Uh, but uh, you know, these, these observations that I showed you, uh, at least grossly speaking, uh, you know, this one, this one and this one, 
has similarities to the numerical results. Although I, I don't think the numerics can get the details of this dispersion as precisely the experiment. Yeah. They see a pseudo gap on the antinode. They see something like an arc. Yeah. So you would say not unrelated? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the numeric work is very nice, but they are also, they tend to be, sometimes we at high, you know, the, to get to the strong coupling regime, they are rather high temperatures. Uh, and also they don't have sometimes real time data, they have imaginary time data. And, uh, so the experiments are ahead of the numerics <laughs> is the bottom line. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, sure. um, so uh, last two questions, please uh, uh, be fast, Leo and Walter. Um, Leo, sorry. Uh, who's next? I think Walter. No, you're next. Well, you're next. Leo. Oh, okay. I just wanted to follow up on the earlier, just a technical question. So you said you, you know, coarse grading will give you defi uh, de tau squared, but don't you get uh, you'll get processional like terms in the Lagrangian? Oh, sure, sure. You can get terms like that. Uh, they'll end but, up being. Uh, yeah. Be under I mean, it's that will involve L. L has a precession in it. So there could be additional couplings with L, yeah. Right. right. But I guess it doesn't, you know, I mean, this Hamiltonian seems to look, looks very reasonable for, you know, quantum dynamics of a, of a vector field, phi. Yeah, I mean, it's very important that it's not a spin, but a rotor. That's really the key point. <laughs> you know, you can imagine adding a spin, but then you're all wrong with the Latin theorem. You add a rotor, and the important point is that this, whatever the local degree of freedom is here, as a singlet ground state and a triplet excited state, that's all you need. You can you can imagine and all kinds of Hamiltonians locally that will give you that feature. They're all good. <laughs> Sorry, but the distinction is that you're you're uh, projecting down to singlet and triplet as opposed to allowing all else. Is that what you mean? Uh, yes. No. But uh, I'm not. But you know, sometimes you think of the paramagnon, uh, but it's just, you know, say it's a spin one object, but not really when it's fluctuating, it's both spin zero and spin one. Oh, uh, I see. And I'm also saying that you can't add a spin a half. That would be not allowed. You know, if you mm -hmm. just add a spin a half, uh, an actual spin, that would be totally wrong. Okay, thank you. And then our final question from uh, Walter. Yeah, okay, thank you. Hi, Subir. So hi, Walter. I just like, hi to compare and know whether you, you sort of abandon a previous theory of yours I found very exciting, <laughs> namely <laughs> the one with, with Matthias Scheurer and also, also Anton George was involved in the numerics part where you took the point of view uh, having sort of a spin density wave where the long range yeah. uh, magnetic order was destroyed by yeah. strong fluctuation, but the charge sector essentially looked like spin density wave. Now today uh, you made some more negative statements about spin density <laughs> wave. I wonder whether this applies what you said today, just about plain spin density wave, which of course will not work, or whether you sort of uh, yeah now favor this well, new theory uh, and the old one we should throw into the trash, uh, which would I find a pity because <laughs> it was very aesthetic. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, <laughs> all right. So let's just say that uh, understanding has evolved. So this paper, I think that you're referring to with uh, Matthias and others. Uh, so that was a theory of fluctuating spin density waves. Right. Uh, and what it gives you at zeroth order um, is the whole on metal. I mean, it gives you another version of this whole on metal. Mm -hmm. And then to actually compute the electronic uh, spectrum that we compared with numerical data, we had to take a convolution of whole on and spin on, and you know, it, it involves some gymnastics. Right. Uh, and you know, there were some uh, free parameters there, and we weren't so that that last step of forming a bound state, we did not perform. Okay. I mean, I, in the end, I think uh, you know, if you perform that second step of forming a bound state, then this theory will give you the same phase of matter. It's just coming at it from a way that you don't have, you know, it's not a simple mean field theory that you can just diagonalize and compute all the things. Yeah. You it would take months of work to compute the things that we computed okay. Okay. <laughs> within a few lines in this new approach. Uh -huh. uh, so but the shape of but, the but, but is it, different, right? Yes, but now the nature of the critical point is different. It gives you the critical theory for the strange metal. It gives you a rather different theory 
from this new theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're both strongly coupled theories and they, they look rather different. And, uh, you know, I think there it's open. Uh, but one of the things the new theory does, which I didn't really go into, was it gives you extra Fermi surfaces. Uh, and that can, uh, you know, we think is supported by this big peak in the specific heat that's seen near optimal doping. So this new theory can get this very big peak, whereas the uh, old one couldn't. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm, okay, obviously I should admit I'm favoring this, but we learned a lot from that old approach, which has been built into this new approach. I mean, this yeah, yeah, that yeah. old approach was really, if you wish, that old approach was all about this gauge field. It didn't have the other two. It only had yeah. the S2S gauge field. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, it's amazing. <laughs> After so many years, we still finding things I really didn't understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, at this you. point, I would like to thank everyone and Subir uh, for this wonderful talk. And um, thank you. <laughs> so questions. And uh, we will now move on <coughs> to the next speaker, Max, Max Medlitsky. Uh, Max, can you share your screen? And we can. All right, perfect. All right, so um, so um, we are very pleased to have our as our final speaker, um, Matt, Max Mitlitsky from MIT. Um, so Max received uh, his um, undergraduate and master's degree um, from University of British Columbia in uh, Vancouver, um, and even at the time he was uh, writing influential papers, I remember uh, reading his um, paper on anomalous currents when like, he was in um, UBC. And then after uh, graduating from UBC, he um, moved to Harvard uh, University, which he, um, from which he got his uh, PhD in uh, 2011. And then he had a postdoc uh, in uh, Calvi Institute at Santa Barbara, uh, until uh, 2015, and he had a faculty uh, appointment at uh, Perimeter Institute and uh, Waterloo in, in Canada, uh, and then finally he moved to MIT and started uh, as an assistant professor in uh, 2017. So in addition to his uh, very influential work on strongly correlated systems and topological phases um, and so on, he also is um, the recipient of the Kimmel Award uh, in 2013, as well as the New Horizons Prize in 2020. And we are very pleased to have uh, Max as our final speaker. And Max, please um, take it from here. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and the very kind introduction. I remember a couple of recent pro uh, progress in many body theories conferences, I think in Ohio and Rostock, they were, they were really great. Uh, can people hear me well? Yes? Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and pl please, uh, please, uh, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to ask them during the talk. I think that's, that's more fun. Uh, yes, so I'd like to talk about, uh, about um, some work uh, done last year and uh, there is going to be a new updated version of this uh, of this paper on archive soon now uh, um, I'm going to talk about a rather rather old subject boundary criticality in the ON model uh, but I'm going to try to convince you that uh, um, some things were some actually really basic questions were not uh, um, not properly understood in the uh, in the old days um, and uh, th there's been some some progress on that recently uh, and uh, I should I, I should uh, apologize uh, from the beginning that uh, actually I, I'll mention some uh, some quantum models, but actually most of my talk is about is going to be about classical statmac models. So and there uh, it seems like things are not are not settled. Okay, so the subject of my talk is uh, boundary criticality. So what is boundary criticality? Well, uh, imagine that you have a bulk system that's uh, going through a mm, 
phase transition. So, um, and let, let, let's say the phase transition is described uh, by a conformal field theory. And uh, now suppose you want to study the system uh, in the presence of a boundary. So maybe you want to compute uh, correlation functions involving uh, operators on the boundary and also operators in the bulk. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, points that, uh, that can be made uh, right away about, about this problem. First of all, uh, um, the um, boundary criticality is really different from, in general, different from the bulk criticality. For instance, uh, the spectrum of um, scaling dimensions of boundary fields uh, is distinct from that in the bulk. The second point is that uh, the boundary conformal field theory um, is not unique. For, for a given bulk critical point, there can be uh, uh, distinct boundary universality classes. Uh, and then you, you can tune uh, between these boundary universality classes by uh, changing the details of the Hamiltonian uh, near the boundary, you know, loosely speaking, there can be more than uh, than a single um, boundary condition in the infrared. Um, okay, so like I said, uh, this boundary criticality is really an old problem, uh, going going back to classical statistical mechanics uh, in the 70s and 80s. Um, but uh, there's been uh, some resurgent interest in the field uh, lately. And uh, th this, I think, is driven uh, from at least two directions. The first direction is kind of, uh, in general, improved understanding of conformal field theory in dimension uh, larger than two, um, driven, driven uh, particularly by the conformal bootstrap, by, um, by um, successes in conformal bootstrap. Um, and the second direction is, uh, is from, um, well, um, from uh, quantum matter, uh, and uh, in particular from the physics of topological phases. So we know that uh, many topological phases, uh, while, um, while gapped in the bulk, host protected gapless boundary states. And, uh, well, you know, uh, that has driven, uh, driven interest in boundary physics in general. Now, uh, for a long time, it was thought that uh, for, for, um, for these um, for this, um, phases, uh, the existence of the bulk gap is crucial for the protection of the, of the boundary states. Um, however, it was later realized that sometimes, even when the bulk um, gap closes, the boundary survives in the boundary state, the non-trivial boundary state, survives in some, in some form. Uh, and, uh, well, then it falls squarely in the domain of boundary criticality because you have a bulk gapless, gapless system and uh, you, you're studying the boundary, the boundary behavior. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, one very specific uh, setup is that you have a symmetry-protected topological phase in the bulk and you drive it towards some uh, symmetry-breaking some symmetry breaking transition, and sometimes at the critical point, uh, the the surface state survives in in, in, in some form. I think this was first uh, um, first noted by uh, Tarun Grover and Ashwin Vishwanath in some in some examples. But there's been actually a lot of literature uh, on this uh, lately. And uh, towards the end of my talk, I will I will mention some quantum models of this of this flavor. However, like I said, most of my talk is going to be about classical StatMac, in fact, about uh, one of the simplest uh, StatMac models out there, a textbook model, the classical ON model. So what is the classical ON model? Well, uh, take uh, classical spins, just n component vectors of unit uh, length, sitting on sides of a um, hypercubic lattice, um, and uh, couple them with the nearest neighbor coupling Kij. Now, I'd like to consider this model uh, in the presence of a boundary. So, kind of think about a semi-infinite system. And uh, for spins sitting on the boundary, let this coupling be K1. 
And uh, for, for the rest of the spins, let the coupling be K. And I want to study the phase diagram of this classical model as a function of two parameters, temperature and the ratio K1 over K, the ratio of the surface spin coupling to the bulk uh, spin coupling. All right. Well, what, what can be said? Well, first of all, um, this model is going to have a bulk phase transition as long as it's above the uh, lower uh, critical dimension. Uh, it's going to have a bulk phase transition at some critical temperature Tc, where the spins in the bulk uh, order. So what happens in the presence of a boundary? Well, um, here is the accepted phase diagram when dimension D is greater than 3. Um, we will come back to what happens in D equal 3 later. D equal 3 uh, will be the interesting, the interesting case where things are still not, not settled. Um, by the way, D here always refers to the bulk, to the bulk dimension. Uh, all right, so if D is greater than 3, then you, know, you open up a textbook uh, and here is the phase diagram, including the boundary. And, uh, well, what, what are the phases? Well, um, if this uh, surface coupling K1 is not too large, then what happens is that the uh, boundary and the bulk order at the same critical temperature Tc. This is known as the ordinary boundary universality class. Now, if you make K1 large, then what can happen is that the surface can actually order before the bulk orders. Um, at, a, at a higher temperature, that's this green line here. Um, and then the surface transition, well, is just, uh, you know, the bulk, is, the, the bulk still has a finite correlation length here. So this is a pure surface transition described by the D minus one dimensional uh, OM universality class. So then we go from a phase where both bulk and surface are disordered to a phase where the surface is ordered and the bulk is still disordered. Now the, the more interesting transition is one where uh, the bulk orders in the presence of a surface order. So there is still a single there, there are still singularities at this at this phase transition and it's known as the extraordinary uh, boundary universality class. Finally there is this multicritical point um, separating the ordinary from the extraordinary region at the bulk critical temperature and this is known as the special transition. Alright, so, so, so this is the accepted phase diagram when dimension D is greater than 3. Now, uh, and note this is the phase diagram in the absence of any symmetry breaking field on the boundary. One can also consider uh, turning on a symmetry breaking field on the boundary and then it's believed that the model admits just a single a boundary universality class, which is known as normal. Same universality class for all values of the uh, surface coupling K1. And uh, the interesting uh, fact is that if the bulk dimension D is greater than 3, then it's believed that morally this, um, the extraordinary transition, which takes place in the absence of any symmetry breaking field on the boundary is the same as the normal transition. Uh, essentially, it doesn't matter whether you break the symmetry on the boundary um, explicitly or spontaneously, once you have a finite uh, um, surface um, order parameter, you have, the same, uh, you have the same universality class of the transition. This is easiest to understand for Ising spins uh, which are kind of rigid, but it's also believed to be true for um, for spins with um, when with n um, greater than one. Um, essentially, it's believed that the fluctuations of the goldstone modes associated with this surface with this ordered surface decouple from the bulk fluctuations at the extraordinary transition as long as d is greater than three. All right. So this is this is the lore. Now, uh, what will be uh, the subject of my talk will be what happens when the dimension d is equal to 3. Um, and, and here we'll see there are some surprises. Well, first of all, uh, if we are talking about Ising spins, 
Then the same story holds uh, for dimension equal to three, uh, same, same phase diagram, same kind of uh, phase transitions. The situation is more interesting uh, for n equal to two, right? So x, y, x, y spins. So here we no longer um, can have, uh, the system can lo no longer support true long range uh, order on the boundary uh, for temperature greater than the bulk critical temperature, right? We know that uh, strictly in two dimensions, there is, um, there is no true uh, long range order for, for x, y spins. However, you can have a quasi long range order on the boundary. So the, the, the phase diagram still has the same topology as, as before, but this, this corner of the phase diagram is a phase where the bulk is disordered and the surface supports quasi long range order. And then this transition is just a standard two dimensional costerless Taulas transition, this, this green line. So that's, uh, that's understood. Um, but what about this extraordinary transition? Uh, what happens as um, the bulk orders in the presence of this uh, surface with quasi long range order? Uh, what's the nature of the extraordinary transition? So it turns out that uh, this question was not settled in the literature um, before, b before my paper. Uh, and uh, actually, there was not a lot of discussion of it. Really, the only, the only discussion I could find is in, in, is in this uh, numerical paper uh, by Deng, Blot and Nightingale. Um, it's, it's a Monte Carlo paper. And uh, one scenario that they put forward is the following, that, um, well, above TC, the surfaces um, doesn't have true long range order, but maybe right at TC, oh, but maybe right at TC, the surface uh, does order. Well, that would essentially mean that the surface order parameter has a jump uh, across, across TC as, as shown here. And this, uh, this picture was roughly consistent with their um, Monte Carlo data. Um, well, th th this sounds a little, a little funny, but actually it's quite hard to shoot down immediately. Uh, why? Well, uh, we know that um, for t greater than tc, the merman wagner theorem prohibits um, existence of true long-range order on the boundary. Um, but right at tc, um, in some sense, all bets are off, right? Because if you think about uh, integrating the bulk out right at tc, um, the bulk fluctuations are going to induce uh, power law interactions of the boundary spins. And we know that when we have power law interactions, uh, in general, the merman wagner theorem no longer applies, and you can actually have a true long range order uh, even in two dimensions. Um, so, 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 so this scenario is hard to shoot down, uh, kind of from general principles. Nevertheless, I will show that it doesn't occur. Um, instead, what happens is the following. Along this extraordinary uh, line, the two-point function of the boundary or the parameter takes the following form. It decays as a power of logarithm of the separation of the, of the two spins. So it decays very, very slowly, but nevertheless it does go to zero as the separation goes to infinity. So there is no true, true long-range order uh, at, at the bulk TC. Um, so the boundary is almost ordered, but not, but not quite. Um, another way of looking at this is that if you uh, approach the bulk transition starting in this uh, phase with quasi long range order, uh, then uh, the Lattinger parameter of the, or the stiffness of the, um, of, of the surface uh, diverges logarithmically. I remember this Lattinger parameter is what controls controls the, um, the power law of the two-point two function. So I term this uh, the extraordinary log universality class, uh, boundary universality class, to distinguish it from the uh, true extraordinary 
universality class that one has, say, for Isingspins in three dimensions or uh, for um, other um, ON um, in uh, d greater than 3, where the spin-spin correlation function at infinite separation really goes to a constant. Um, all right. So that, um, and, and uh, I'll, I'll explain um, where this behavior comes from shortly. I'll, I'll give a randomization group um, proof of, of, of this fact. All right. So this is n equal to 2. What happens for n greater than 2 in three dimensions? Well, uh, we know that when uh, t is greater than tc, we essentially have, um, you know, the boundary is essentially a purely two-dimensional system. Um, and uh, this, for n greater than 2, we must have a finite, finite correlation length. Uh, we can have neither uh, true long-range order nor quasi-long-range order. So therefore, um, the um, phase diagram does not mandate the existence of separate uh, ordinary and extraordinary um, regions. You know, there is, there, there is no phase like this. There is no <laughs> extra phase above TC, um, above the bulk TC. So it's very conceivable that uh, for all values of surface coupling K1, one just has a single universality, boundary universality class, the ordinary universality class. However, uh, it's also not ruled out that uh, the phase diagram looks like this, that uh, you have at the bulk TC, you have several boundary universality classes depending on the value of the surface coupling K1. Um, and uh, these distinct boundary universality classes connect the same uh, phases above and below bulk TC. You know, there, there is kind of no theorem that tells you that that this cannot cannot happen, although this is kind of a much much uh, less minimal scenario than the one on the left. And in fact, uh, if you, if you look at the literature, I think people people kind of implicitly always assumed that uh, that this is that this is what happens that that you have just a single boundary universality class uh, for all K one. So each one of these uh, of these scenarios occurs. And I'll try to convince you uh, that actually the answer depends on the value of n, of n of the on model. Um, when n is large but finite, we have the situation on the left with just a single ordinary boundary universality class. On the other hand, uh, now, now I'm going to treat n as a formal, as a continuous parameter. Uh, and I can show um, essentially rigorously that when n is just above 2, the phase diagram has this form uh, with distinct ordinary and extraordinary um, regions. And the extraordinary region is of the same character as for n equal 2, as for xy spins, that is the spin-spin correlation function on the boundary, decays as a uh, power of logarithm of separation. The only uh, new element is that this exponent q now depends depends on n. Um, what happens? Of, of course, this is you know treating n as as a continuous variable is kind of a formal device. Ultimately, we will be interested in what happens for uh, integer values of n greater than two, three, four, etc. And I, I I will comment comment on that later. Um, but first, where where does this picture come from? Where where do these two 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 different uh, regimes of n uh, come from? What's the intuition? Let, let, let me first explain the intuition. Well, um, first the, the regime with large n. Well, when n is large, one can turn the crank of uh, large n calculations, standard large n calculations. And if you take uh, n equal infinity, you find that you don't have a special, uh, you don't have a special fixed point uh, in d equal 3, you only find an ordinary fixed point. Uh, and you can understand it also in the following way. You can take dimensions slight, slightly lar larger than 3. Then the phase diagram looks like this. We discussed this. And you can track what happens to the special fixed point for large n as dimension uh, approaches 3. And what you find is that the scaling dimension of the uh, 
uh, boundary or the parameter at the special fixed point for large n and for d close to 3 has the following form. So this is a um, calculation done by, by Ono and Akaba a long time ago. And you see that, well, we don't know what this 1 over n squared term looks like, but from the first two terms at least, it looks like for large n, as d approaches 3, the scaling dimension of the uh, boundary or the parameter at the special transition goes to 0. What does it mean scaling dimension is equal to 0? It means that uh, you have long-range order. We have long-range order at the extraordinary transition. So it looks like the special fixed point is approaching the extraordinary fixed point as d goes to 3 when n is large. And maybe when d is equal to 3, they exactly uh, uh, collide and annihilate so that you are just left with the ordinary fixed point in d equal 3 for large n. And this is indeed what my, uh, what my randomization group calculation um, shows, as, as I'll discuss in a second. All right, so this is the regime of large n. What is the intuition in the regime when n is just uh, slightly larger than 2? Well, um, we know that when n is equal to 2, we have three fixed points, ordinary, special, and extraordinary. We now running, kind of getting ahead of ourselves, we also know that this is extraordinary log, but doesn't matter for, for, for this purpose. Um, what's important is that uh, fixed points uh, in a randomization group don't just appear and disappear at will. They uh, disappear by colliding with each other and they appear in pairs. So, so these um, fixed points are all far away from each other. So they cannot immediately disappear when you make n slightly larger than 2. They have to survive for some range of n. So that's the, that's the intuition for, for, for this regime. Uh, now let me, uh, let me support this intuition with uh, some renormalization group calculations. Okay, so how, how do these uh, renormalization group calculations go? We want to understand the, the region of the phase diagram where the surface coupling K1 is large. In this region, there is a strong tendency for the boundary to have a local, at least a local um, order. So let me describe the, uh, the boundary uh, by a local order parameter n, that's going to be a unit vector, and write down uh, a nonlinear sigma model for this uh, boundary order parameter. And for a mo moment, let me imagine that the coupling of the boundary to the bulk is turned off. So we just have a pure boundary layer of, of strongly coupled spins. What, let me remind you what happens in that case. Well, uh, Polikov taught us what happens to this two-dimensional sigma model. Um, we have this renormalization group flow of the coupling constant G. One of the G is essentially the inverse stiffness of the of the boundary, and uh, well, wh what is this flow? Uh, this flow is uh, towards g equal infinity. So if we start uh, with a small coupling constant, it runs away to infinity. This is interpreted as the model acquiring a finite correlation length, right? There is um, the, the, the O3 model in two the ON model in two dimensions with n greater than two has a finite correlation length. Okay, well, well known physics. Question. The question we want to understand is how is this physics modified when uh, we include the bulk, when we couple these boundary layers, layer of spins to the bulk. And here I'll just tell you the answer. The answer is that you can still write down a renormalization group equation for this boundary coupling G, but the, it has essentially the same form as without the bulk but the coefficient in front of g squared is modified. There is, a there is still this contribution from the boundary, um, same, as, same as what Polikov taught us, but there is also now a contribution to the coefficient from the bulk. Uh, what is this S? S turns out to be a ratio of certain universal amplitudes at the normal fixed point. Remember, the normal fixed point is the one where you apply a symmetry breaking field uh, on the boundary. Um, and the normal fixed point exists in any 
in any dimension. So um, yeah, so um, it will not matter uh, very much what, precisely what this S is, but um, j just su suffices to say that it's a universal, it's a universal and dependent number. Um, all right. So um, what is the physics? Well, the physics crucially depends on the sign of this uh, coefficient alpha. If alpha is positive, then g flows logarithmically to zero in the infrared, and this is precisely the extraordinary log fixed point. If you integrate the, um, the RG equation along this flow, you find that the boundary, um, cor the correlation function of the boundary or the parameter precisely has this, um, has this decay with the exponent Q expressed in terms of alpha. That's the extraordinary log physics. What about, um, well, if alpha is less than zero, then we know that the g equals zero fixed point is unstable. G runs away from a g equals zero. What is, what is the fate of the system um, in this regime? We will discuss, uh, we, don't, we don't know, we don't, we don't know precisely, but we will discuss some scenarios um, in a second. All right. Now, we see, you know, things crucially depend on the sign of alpha. So is alpha positive or negative? And for general n, we, we don't know, but there are certain limits where, where we do know the answer. First of all, when n is equal to 2, um, the, bulk, uh, the, the boundary contribution to alpha vanishes, and we just have this first term here. This first term is manifestly positive. So when n is equal to 2, alpha is positive. We have the extraordinary log uh, universality class. It's, it's, it's stable. And we know that for n equal to 2, just by the topology of the phase diagram, there must be an extraordinary, there must be an extraordinary region. So that's, that's good. That's, that's reassuring. And we now know that that extraordinary region is of the extraordinary log character. What about when n is large? When n is large, one can actually explicitly calculate this, uh, this number s. Uh, and, and here is the answer that you get. Uh, you, you find that, um, that alpha is uh, negative. And in fact, one can also calculate one over n corrections to this, to this number and, and get this n minus 4. Uh, it, y y yes, Leo? Yeah, I didn't quite understand the logic because uh, if alpha is positive, that just says you have an ordered state uh, for the for the bound for the surface because this RG is a surface RG. It's not quite I correctly. But then, how, how do you oh, okay coupling to the bulk? It's it's not quite ordered because uh, you know G alpha on, G only flows to zero logarithmically, and if you inter, you know if you put in the anomalous dimension, which actually is not renormalized by the bulk, it turns out, and you integrate the RG equation, you find that um, that you accumulate um, that you accumulate this logarithm. So it's not quite; it's almost ordered, but not but not quite. But maybe may, maybe that's not your your question. Sorry. So this flow, the flow that you have coupling to the bulk, the the flow for with the alpha. That's the that's the flow of G in the bulk. This is the this is the modification due to the coupling to the bulk of the flow of this uh, boundary coupling constant G. So I'm suppressing what the coupling to the bulk is. Um, mm -hmm. If you have time towards the end of the talk, I can uh, I can show you um, how exactly these calculations are done. But the the final answer is that. This coupling constant G, even when we couple to the bulk, it make it makes sense, and it's but it, but its flow is modified by the coupling to the bulk, and it's modified in in this manner. Right. So I guess the the point I'm missing uh, is so this describes this the equations you have here. They describe how the the surface, you know, what happens above the what you call an extraordinary transition. It describes the properties of the surface. Yes. 
And what I'm what I'm confused about is where's the where's the information of how those log de correlated uh, power of a log correlated surface uh, degrees of freedom impact the bulk the bulk transition. Very good. Yeah, that's a great question. So it turns remember I told you about the normal the, the normal transition. That's a transition in the field. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and I told you that when dimension D is greater than three, the um, normal transition essentially coincides with the extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And that's essentially still true for the bulk correlation functions when D is equal to three. Be is then, it because the decay is so slow? Uh, uh, the surface degrees of freedom is so, is so slow. It's only a log. The, the well well so 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 so, so there's oh okay g goes flows to zero i see right so 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 because g flows to zero essentially uh, again the essentially the boundary degrees of freedom decouple from they're the, like fro they're basically their fluctuations are weak essentially they're, they're, they're weak that's right so the bulk, okay that's a good uh, okay i just was looking for that intuition okay thank that, you that, that that's right and now now it turns out that uh, you know if you, if you think about the bulk and uh, like i said the bulk is essentially described by the normal fixed point but <laughs> turns out this is only true in the limit where you scale both the coordinates perpendicular to the surface and along the surface in the same in the same manner if you if you take the opposite limit where say um you know, you, you go into the bulk, but you separate the coordinates yes, yes. by a very, very large distance, then, you know, the, you, you recover this kind of log, log mm -hmm. so, so, so there are some subtleties to this, to this statement. Yeah. The there's, there's a scaling function uh, with a, with a ratio of X, you know, X parallel and X perp or something like that. Yeah, that's right. But for very large separation along the boundary, it actually crosses over. From the normal form to a different to a different okay. form, and, Thank then, you. and that, that's that's a subtlety. <clears throat> yeah, but great question. All right, so we were talking about this um, behavior of alpha when n is large, and like like I said, you can calculate explicitly, and 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 and, and here is um here 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 is the result that you get. So you find that uh, alpha has to change sign as n increases from two to infinity. Um, and well, alpha is a continuous function of n. We expect so, so. So we expect there has to be a zero somewhere at some critical value of n equal to n c, and n c has to be greater than two. So so there exists a finite region where um, the extraordinary log phase exists and is stable, n between two and n c. Um, so what is n c? That's that's kind of the the most interesting question, perhaps. Uh, well, if you just take this large n estimate and um, uh, extrapolate it down to moderate values of n, you find that n c is somewhere around four. Um, how accurate this estimate is, uh, we don't we don't know. Um, I I would like to actually advertise some. Um, some work that's going to appear hopefully soon. Some work with uh, Ilya Grusberg, uh, his uh, graduate student Jay Padayasi, uh, Mark Maneri, who is a postdoc in uh, Lausanne, and uh, Abhijit Krishnan, who is a who, um, graduate student at MIT. And uh, th this, um, this work actually uses conformal bootstrap to, to compute alpha. And under certain set of assumptions, we're actually able to rigorously show that nc is greater than 3. So 3 is in this according to to to, to, to this um, to this work is uh, in the extraordinary log phase which is which is kind of <laughs> means that this region does contain some integer values of n some physical values of n. All right. Uh, so very good. Now, next question is, what is the evolution of the phase diagram past this uh, n equal to nc? Well, when n is close to nc, this uh, coefficient alpha is small. 
So really, uh, the physics is going to be um, determined by the next terms in the beta function. And uh, so near n equal to nc, I can linearize um, the, the coefficient of the first term, the g squared term, and then there, there is also a, some high order term, some g cubed term. And uh, the physics is really going to be determined by the sign of this coefficient b. So uh, we have to consider both, uh, we don't know actually what the sign is, so we have to consider uh, both, both possibilities. If the sign is positive, then uh, what happens is um, for n just below nc, when you look at the RG equation, you find an infrared unstable uh, fixed point at the perturbatively accessible value of g. And you can calculate all the critical properties at this fixed point, uh, the scaling dimension of the order parameter, of the boundary order parameter, uh, becomes small at this, at this fixed point. What is this infrared unstable fixed point? Well, natural guess that, it, that it's the special transition. We know that um, when n is equal to 2, there is a special transition between the extraordinary log and the ordinary regimes. So the natural guess is that, uh, you know, th this line of special transitions just continues uh, between n equal to 2 and n equal nc. And when n is equal to nc, it hits it collides with the extraordinary log fixed point and then they annihilate for n greater than nc such that or only the ordinary boundary universality class is left for n greater than nc so this is this is the simplest scenario second scenario is that this coefficient is negative um, in this scenario uh, the special transition survives for some range um, for some range of um, n above nc um, and the extraordinary transition also survives but it changes its character for in this scenario for n slightly larger than nc you find um, that the uh, extraordinary fixed point moves away from g equals zero to a finite value of g again kind of perturbatively accessible but finite value of g uh, and we get a we get a sta infrared stable fixed point at this small uh, value of g. And uh, we uh, refer to this as the extraordinary power universality class. So here, really, the uh, boundary um, correlation function will decay in a power law manner, not um, in this logarithmic manner, but really true power law. This will be a true boundary conformal, conformal fixed point. Uh, so this, uh, okay, so this is what happens for n just slightly larger than nc. And well, we know that when n is equal to infinity, we only the ordinary universality class is left. So the natural guess is that for um, larger n, eventually the extraordinary power fixed point collides with the special fixed point and the two annihilate at some larger critical value n equal to nc2. So here is, here is another way to, to look at the phase diagram in the two scenarios. Um, here is scenario one where the special transition just uh, as, as we approach nc occurs at larger and larger value of um, kappa and well eventually disappears for n greater than nc and here is scenario two where the extraordinary um, uh, fixed point evolves into the extraordinary power fixed point when uh, n is in this range uh, in this range here. Uh, scenario two is kind of more more involved than scenario one, but because we don't know what the sign of b is uh, at the moment, uh, we kind of have to consider have to consider both. All right. So this is uh, this is everything that we know analytically at this point, and uh, well, uh, really, uh, really the rest has to be settled with with numerics uh, and. Let me remind you, the open questions are, what is the value of nc and which of these two scenarios is realized? So um, in the remaining uh, time, let me uh, tell you about um, current um, understanding from numerics, from Monte Carlo. Um, and let me begin with numerics on classical models, just classical ON model. And uh, if I have time later, I'll also talk about the 
uh, the quantum models. So uh, actually there was, until my paper um, appeared, there was very little uh, numerical, numerical work on, the, on, on, this, um, on this problem. Uh, I could find only two uh, uh, classical Monte Carlo studies for n equal to 3. So uh, we know, you know, theoretically we kind of already know what happens for n equal to 2, so the next interesting value is n is equal to 3. Uh, and here is, okay, so, so, so here is um, classical Monte Carlo on O3 model. And this paper by Crack uh, actually, well, essentially couldn't, couldn't tell what happens for large values of the surface, of the surface coupling. It, it, it's, uh, yeah, um, it, it couldn't quite, quite make out what the system crosses over to. And uh, this uh, subsequent paper by Deng, Blot and Nightingale, which I already have mentioned, uh, what um, they saw actually a hint of a special transition for n equal to 3. So what's plotted here is the binder ratio associated with the surface or the parameter and uh, there is a crossing point in this binder ratio as a function of the surface um, coupling and uh, what's plotted is different, different system sizes. So this is kind of standard way that you, that you look for a phase transition. Uh, you, you look at the binder ratio and you look for a crossing point. And here they seem to find a crossing point at a finite value of surface enhancement kappa that they uh, thought might be a sign of a of a of a special of a special transition. They were not able to uh, determine the character of the of, of the phase with large kappa of the you know putative extraordinary phase. So this was all, all we kind of knew from classical Monte Carlo when, when my paper came out. But there have been a cup, oh, one, one more data point. There was actually also a study for n equal to 4 uh, by, uh, by Deng. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, what, what he saw, saw for n equal to 4 is quite similar to what was also seen for n equal to 3. So again, there is a crossing point in the bin the ratio of the surface or the parameter. Again, he couldn't... Uh, determine what the nature of the, of the high um, kappa surface phase is. All right, now, since my paper came out, there have been a number of um, large-scale, high-quality Monte Carlo studies. And here is one uh, by uh, Francesca Tolden. Um, and uh, so he studied the, the classical O3 model. Um, and again, he observes a crossing point in the um, surface binder, binder ratio as a function of system size and surface coupling. And he was able to extract uh, the... So, so he interprets this as a special transition and he was able to extract the critical exponents, uh, the surface critical exponents associated with this uh, special transition, the um, scaling dimension of the surface order parameter and the correlation length exponent. Uh, Francesco also investigated the large kappa um, regime of the phase diagram and uh, his findings appear uh, to be consistent with the extraordinary log universality class. So here is for instance the two-point function of the surface or the parameter and you see it, it, it has a very slow decay that appears consistent with, uh, with uh, lo logarithmic, logarithmic decay of this form. Perhaps even more interesting is this uh, stiffness of the system. So um, for a true uh, conformal fixed point, boundary conformal fixed point, this expression L times the stiffness should approach a constant. Whereas for the extraordinary log phase, it should grow logarithmically with system size. Essentially, you know, the, the, the stiffness of the, of the system in the extraordinary log regime is going to be dominated by the stiffness of the boundary and we know that the stiffness of the, of the boundary is essentially one over the coupling constant of the boundary and we, we, we said that this coupling constant flows to zero logarithmically so we expect that the stiffness grows logarithmically and uh, we see first of all in, in numerics that the stiffness does not saturate even for very large system sizes I think the largest system size here is around L equal 400 and it does seem to be roughly consistent with logarithmic growth. And from these uh, two um, 
um, from these two uh, observables, one can extract the coefficient alpha. Remember, q is also related to alpha, and you, um, Francesca finds it to be in this in this range. All right. So it seems like uh, it seems from Francesca's numerics that um, n equal to three is below n c. That there is an extraordinary log phase, an ordinary phase, and a special transition between them for n equal to 3. Um, that's quite quite exciting. Um, all right. Now, um, there was also a detailed classical Monte Carlo study of the n equal to 2 model in the large kappa regime, in the large surface enhancement regime. And again, it found results consistent with uh, the extraordinary log um, phase at large kappa. So here is again the two-point function seems to decay uh, as a power of logarithm. Uh, the power seems to be the same independent of where in the um, extraordinary log phase one sits. Here is the stiffness. Again, it seems to grow logarithmically. And uh, yeah, the, the, the exponent extracted from the stiffness and the coefficient alpha extracted from the stiffness seems to match um, the coefficient extracted from this power q. Remember, um, they're, they're related like this. And the power, um, the, the value is, is, quoted, is quoted here. All right, so, so again, uh, things seem to be consistent with the extraordinary log universality class for large kappa and n equal to 2. Um, okay, now, um, the ne so, so, so here is, by the way, um, by the way, the, the, the kind of compilation of values of alpha for, uh, for for the two values of n that have been studied, and you see that alpha decreases as n is increased. Well, you know that's that's consistent with our picture. Remember, alpha has to change sign as as n passes n c, and we see that alpha initially decreases. All right. Now, which of these two scenarios do we have for the evolution of the phase diagram? Is it the one on the left or the one on the right? And we, we don't know yet for sure, but it, you know, if I had to bet at this point, I would say that uh, it, it's the one on the left. Why? Well, remember for this scenario, um, for this first scenario, um, the special transition approaches the um, extra ordinary log fixed point as n goes to nc and annihilates with it at nc. Uh, and in particular, as n approaches nc, the um, scaling dimension of the uh, boundary order parameter and the inverse correlation length um, at, uh, and the inverse of the correlation length exponent at the special transition becomes small. And well, here is, here is a compilation of, of that data at the special transition as a function of n. And you see that both actually decrease as um, as n is increased. And you know, if, if if you look at this paper for n equal to four uh, by Deng from 2006, um, they, they actually become quite small when n is equal to four. Although probably the error bars on on this is also quite large when n is equal to four. But um, so so far this seems to be consistent with first this first scenario for the evolution of the phase diagram um, and uh, mm, critical value of n somewhere somewhere not far from from 4. Okay, so this is this is all the classical Monte Carlo data that I'm going to discuss. Now, how am I how am I doing for time? Uh, um, so you are at uh, minus five minutes, but no, but, 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 but there are still some 10, 10 minutes for, for questions. Is, is, um, is that... Yeah, yeah, we can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I was going to discuss some, some quantum, um, some quantum uh, models too, but uh, let's see uh, what, <laughs> uh, what, the, what the attendance is. Is like um, yeah. Let let me very quickly maybe go through these quantum models. Okay. Um, so 
so, 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 so far I focused on classical models. But one can also consider quantum uh, spin models in two dimensions. Um, and uh, actually, a class of these models have been studied with, with, with quantum Monte Carlo um, in, the last, in the last five years or so. And uh, they, they actually studied different, different geometries, um, but, but um, kind of prototypically, they're all, <laughs> they're all more or less uh, similar to the following model. So um, consider a, a two-dimensional rectangular lattice of spins with nearest neighbor couplings that are, st uh, that are dimerized, dimerized like this. So the red bonds have stronger couplings, JD, and the uh, black bonds have, uh, have, have weak coupling, uh, weaker coupling, J. And then uh, in the bulk, this model has a, has a phase transition from a, a paramagnetic phase at a large ratio of JD over J, where the spins on red bonds just lock into singlets, to a nail phase at JD over J equal to 1, where we just have a square lattice, Heisenberg antiferromagnet, that we know orders in a nail pattern. And uh, th th this phase transition uh, numerically uh, is well confirmed in the bulk to be of the O3 uh, universality class. Um, so, so, so this goes back quite a while. The recent studies focused on the boundary universality in this, in this model. And uh, one can actually study two different types of boundaries. Uh, one is a so-called non-dangling boundary, where the boundary spins are part of these strong red bonds. And then uh, there is a, <coughs> another um, kind of boundary people have considered, which is a dangling boundary, where the spins are part of the um, uh, where the spins are part of the uh, weak black bonds. And w when these uh, boundaries were studied at the bulk critical point, what was found was that for the non-dangling boundary, the um, scaling dimension of the boundary order parameter is quite close to that in the for the ordinary universality class uh, of the classical O3 model. But for the dangling boundary, the scaling dimension was, was very different. And in fact, uh, this, the, roughly the same scaling dimension was seen in a number of, uh, of, um, of um, microscopic models for the, dangling, for the dangling edge. And the first thought that people had was, oh, this has to do with kind of um, SPT physics. Uh, remember, in the beginning of my talk, I said that, um, um, you know, if you, if you drive an SPT, a symmetry-protected topological phase, to a, um, to a phase transition, something of the edge state can, can remain. Now, if you go into the paramagnetic phase here, you can, when spins are spin one-half spins, you can think of it as a kind of weak SPT. You can think about each one of these columns as a kind of Haldane chain with a dangling spin one half on the edge, and then you know, in the paramagnetic phase again, the spin one halves they form a Heisenberg chain. So you expect already in the paramagnet the boundary, the dangling edge, to be gapless, and then you kind of ask what happens to this gapless dangling edge as you approach the bulk transition. So this is exactly the kind of question that that, that I mentioned in one of my introductory slides. Uh, the problem is that, uh, and, and then of course you don't expect the, uh, the ordinary universality class in this case because, uh, well, you know, for the ordinary universality class, if you go into the paramagnetic phase, the boundary has a finite correlation length, uh, whereas, whereas here it would be gapless already in the paramagnetic phase. But, uh, you know, the, the, the big surprise, at least for me, was that, you know, people then also studied the same kind of model, but with spin one, where you don't expect this, um, where you don't expect this um, gapless Heisenberg chain on the edge, you know, spin one chain is gapped. So um, you expect the paramagnetic phase to have a gapped uh, boundary. Nevertheless, at the bulk critical point, the uh, scaling dimension of the boundary or the parameter at the at the dangling edge was almost the same as in the spin one half model. So 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 how to 
how to explain this. And I think the one the one explanation that um, um, that one might uh, might propose um, at, at the present point, and uh, which was actually proposed early in a number of in a number of papers, um, is that perhaps in this model the dangling edge is controlled by the by the special transition. So we know that in the classical O3 model there is a special transition between the extraordinary log phase and the ordinary phase for n equal to 3 and the, the, the scaling dimension of the special transition as extracted by Francesca Tolden and is, is something like this uh, 0.26 well you know looks quite close to what's what is found at the dangling edge the the mystery is that why is this dangling edge at the special transition because you have to for the special transition you have to tune the boundary coupling to be at the special transition it's an infrared unstable fixed point uh, whereas here no tuning was was performed on the edge and in fact you know the same exponent was seen in a number of in a, in a number of microscopic models uh, without fine tuning so so what's going on and, and I, I think the answer is not clear uh, perhaps uh, one one thought is that uh, the correlation length exponent is quite large at the special transition in the O3 model so then you know if you somehow accidentally start close to the special transition it takes a long time to flow away into one of the <coughs> one of the stable boundary phases um, but still still i think this this is quite mysterious so i will i, I will not talk about differences between spin one half and spin one um, and le let me just conclude by saying that well you know the the old textbook uh, uh, on um, classical uh, model um, still still holds surprises uh, as far as boundary criticality is um, concerned. Uh, I, I, I hope uh, um, you know this this will motivate more uh, Monte Carlo work, both on classical and quantum models. I think for for, for both there are still there are still open questions. And uh, I think some of some progress can be made also with conformal bootstrap. Um, yeah. So let 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 me stop here and thank you thank you for your attention. Well, um, thank you, Max, for uh, this very interesting talk. Um, so, any questions from the audience? Oh, Leo, please go ahead. Yeah, I just had a question about the classical uh, ON model criticality about criticality just yeah but uh, pointing out that there's many boundary theories mm -hmm. Leo I think you're you, you, you're free, free, freezing the conditions for the classical model if you're your else. Uh, so for what boundary does this done or is it boundary condition independent? I would think it's very, very strongly dependent on the boundary conditions. Sorry, yeah, so, so, so for a sec, I guess. Uh, is that... uh, Max, did you hear the question? I, I think I, we lost them for a second. Leo, maybe, maybe you can repeat your question because you, you froze for yeah. a <clears throat> Sorry if my as we in the, if can't understand the question, then feel free to ignore. I was asking about the boundary conditions, uh, how the boundary for the classical ON model. You seem to have not said anything about boundary conditions. Yeah, so I mean, this is th this is a UV definition of the model on the lattice. Right, and then you can think about the boundary condition. You know what sets the boundary condition is this ratio of the surface coupling K one to the bulk coupling K. Um, if you want mm -hmm. to, to to do it I in see. a field, if you want to do it in a field theory, you also can. Right, you can write down a phi to the fourth um, field theory in the mm -hmm. bulk, and on the boundary there is going to be a term like C phi squared. C phi squared. Okay. Uh huh. And then, you know, you, you can tune this C to be large and positive or large and negative. Um, 
and those will correspond uh, respectively to the uh, large the, the, the large negative c is one where you know the boundary has a strong tenden tendency to local order that that's kind of the same as the large kappa side oh, of the space see. diagram and then the uh, c large and uh, and positive that, that's you know phi is suppressed on the boundary that's that's the ordinary class and then you can tune between them when you go to the if you work in the four minus epsilon expansion then this is exactly the formalism that is useful and mm -hmm. uh, in fact uh, c equal infinity is the Dirichlet boundary condition c equal zero is the neumann and mm -hmm. uh, c going to minus infinity is is, is the extraordinary um, phase where the boundary actually has has order when when you talk about it um when d is equal to three and fluctuations on the boundary are very strong and also the bulk is strongly coupled uh, or fairly strongly coupled um this the, you know the, this formalism turns out to be not very useful but uh but you know if you want to kind of define the model in the uv you you can like this yes mm -hmm. okay thank you mm -hmm. any other questions um so I, I, I have one uh, then super naive question. Um, so do vortices any, play any role in this story with the boundary and everything? Ah, very, very good question. I don't know if I have, if I have slides on it. It's also, it's also related to this last, uh, to, to, to this last uh, footnote here. So vortices, um, you know, kind of the most natural place for them is for n equal to two. And uh, for so, so, so maybe let's go back to the phase diagram for n equal to two. Ah, this may be good enough. <laughs> um, right. So I said that for n equal to two, the costal is at the costal is starless transition. Um, uh, this green line is the costal starless transition, so of course that's driven by vortices. Mm -hmm. Now we can ask, okay, what is the fate of vortices for this extraordinary log transition? Um, and uh, we expect that they are irrelevant at the extraordinary log transition. Because remember, the stiffness diverges at the extraordinary log transition, so the vortices, the scaling dimension of the vortices, we expect to go to infinity. Now, what about the special transition? Do the vortices play play a role? And it turns out that uh, if you consider a classical model, then they do. Um, they cannot understand the special transition without including vortices. Uh, if you consider quantum models, then uh, by tuning the boundary density, the boundary boson density, you can actually uh, suppress vortices. <clears throat> you can make vortices prohibited by translational symmetry. And then, uh, in that case, you can actually understand uh, the special transition exactly. You can, you can have a, um, a theory for the special transition. But uh, for, for the classical, um, for the classical uh, model, vortices do play a role at the special transition. Um, and uh, for, 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 for other values of n, for n equal to 3, you know, the role of kind of what's similar to vortices is skirmions, and you have the theta term, and you know, that, that's related to this, to this difference in physics for s equal one half, um, s equal one half and s equal to one, and yeah, there is, there is some story there too, but uh, I, I will not, not get into it. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see any other hands. Um, so, uh, at this point, well, I would like to thank both uh, speakers for uh, the wonderful talks, and this concludes uh, the, um, the conference, and thank you for um, all, all the participants as well, and keeping it lively, and um, see you in the next meeting. Thank you all. <laughs>